All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Grüß Gott. A uh, bisschen Deutsch geht immer. A little German is always good. And hola, Anna. Hola. <laughs> hola. So, well, thank you so much for having us on the webinar today. Uh, we want to kick it off with a little introduction for those people that have escaped us so far on social media, on LinkedIn, on the blogs, on the webinars we've been doing, on the podcasts. My name is Andy Grabner. Yes, I know it says Andreas, but please call me Andy unless I offended you or did something wrong because I always say only my mom calls me Andreas if I did something wrong or rude. Hopefully so far I didn't do anything bad. That's please call me Andy. A little bit to myself, it says DevOps activist. I know it sounds strange. Uh, I've been working uh, at Dynatrace for 14 years now. Before that, I did some performance testing and engineering at the previous company. Uh, so my life is all about performance engineering observability. Uh, follow me if, if you want to on Twitter or just send me an email or I'm sure you'll figure out ways. Uh, but what I really love about my job is that like Anna, uh, we are helping hopefully people to build better, more reliable, more performant, more resilient systems. And just one little anecdote, because this is, I think, a good segue to introduce Anna. When I started my career in performance engineering, I was a performance tester on a performance testing product, on a performance testing tool. And my first gig was to actually load test a very large application that was like 18, 20 years ago uh, in Germany. And I remember they wanted me to run 10,000 virtual users. I managed to run one virtual user. That was me clicking uh, in the browser on the refresh button a couple of times, bringing down the whole system. So I brought chaos to their system, showing them the limitations. And uh, this is what really excited me about the whole field. And this is why I like to talk about my experiences and inspire others with what I've learned and hopefully, you know, with this make the world a better place and the better world, the software world a better resilient, more resilient place. But now over to Anna, because you are also pretty fantastic what you are doing and what you've been doing uh, in the last couple of years. Thanks, Andy. I, I don't know how to match that introduction. Like, I mean, I love your title and it's always amazing to see folks that have stayed in their job for as long as Andy has, like 14 years, unheard of, amazing. So extra hand of a clap, like claps to him for being there. But similar to Andy, I also found different spaces in tech where I found my love for technology. So my name is Ana Margarita Medina. I am a senior chaos engineer at Gremlin. For the last five, six years, I've been focusing on introducing chaos into systems in order to build more reliable systems. So I've been at Gremlin for three years. And prior to that, I was at Uber for two years working as a site reliability engineer. My first project there was doing chaos engineering. That's when I got a chance to understand systems and microservices. At that moment, Uber was growing to around 2,000 microservices. And we just had a lot of complexity going on. And we were just like, this is fine. But how do we get to five nines of reliability? And to me, it was really interesting because I come from a background of being a self-taught developer. I did front end, back end, mobile applications for the last 10 years. So when I joined Site Reliability Engineering, all of a sudden, Anna has to say SSH into host and look at prod, look at logs, observability, and monitoring. And that's when I realized I've always been that developer that said it worked on my machine. It's our problem. It's someone else's problem. So I really had an interesting moment to jump into SRE. But when I look back into the SRE practices and some of the work we did at Uber that I get to do now with Gremlin, I always sum it up into the next point in my next slide, where a lot of the work that we get to do in site reliability is, you know, sitting with our teams, ramping up on how we work with them, auditing our services, implementing better practices for them to be more reliable. But there are three goals that you are never really able to escape out of when you think about big picture, this is what we do in the year, in the quarter. And that is that we're driving automation, we're driving for the toil of our production services to go down, and we're also bringing standardization across those critical applications, making sure that we know what to call those critical services, what to call those environments, and how to standardize certain fundamentals across each of these tiers of services. But 
We also learned that in order to be a great SRE, in order to work really well with embedded SREs in your organization, there's a lot of practice that comes to, mm -hmm. to play. It takes time to understand their systems. It's time, it takes time to build reliability, and it takes time to build your team to know how to react and mitigate those incidents when they do occur, or how to automate your ops tooling to auto remediate some of the issues that can come up. And when all of this comes up, hey Andy, next slide. We get a chance to look at my not so amazing graphic on here. But no matter where you are in your chaos engineer, sorry, no matter where you are in your site reliability engineering journey, you can look at this infinity loop and you can move on from any of these stages to the next one. So let's say we are just getting started with building better observability within our organization. We're doing this for the purpose of learning more about our systems. Let's say we only did that in production. We now get a chance to shift left and bring that into development and staging. We now get to throw chaos engineering to make sure that we've set up all those alerting and observability properly, but that our team also knows what these metrics mean where are the conditions that would actually make some of these metrics go up? And then we get a chance to automate some of these things and we get to learn again. We now move on to standardization, practicing some more and we observe again and we make everything better. And we leave learning in the middle because that's the beauty of the work that we do, whether it's advocacy, reliability, engineering, or just making better processes internally. We want to be learning, but when we look at this diagram, I was talking to Jason Yee, who works at Gremlin too, Director of Advocacy, and there was something that was missing. And that is what you can see here in the next slide, where we now also have to call out that if you put chaos engineering across this infinity loop, no matter where you are, you get to validate that all of this is working. So go ahead and throw chaos engineering to validate that you've standardized some of your critical services, whether it's validating your service level objectives that you are creating for your tier zero services, your tier one, throw some chaos engineering to validate that your teams are practicing to be on call, that they're practicing those exercises for load testing and chaos engineering to be ready to handle on what comes next. Mm -hmm. So Anna, first of all, kudos to your graphical skills. I know it is the infinity loop is typically used in other aspects, but I think really great job. And I say kudos because I typically get a lot of negative feedback when I start uh, using my graphical skills, especially with colors. My 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 colleague Alois always gives me his very honest feedback. I really like it, uh, and I also see it's it's great hearing your story, especially your background on, from Uber, what you learned there. Uh, how how this has evolved over time. I remember when I said I was I was standing there 18 years ago and my magic chaos engineering tool was my finger hitting the F5 button on the browser. This was chaos engineering. Fortunately, now things have gone much beyond what, what we had. And this is, I think, great what we are sharing today, what you are sharing with the industry and what we are going to share. But what, what, the, what I understand here, right, the whole goal is that we, if we do it right, if we do chaos from beginning to end, if we continuously learn and continuously validate that our systems work as expected, then essentially, even if there is chaos, if there's fire on the roof or wherever fire in a data center, whatever it is, that we should be fine. The only question is, you know, is this really the true case, yes or no? And I think we actually have a poll prepared for that. It would be interesting to actually understand uh, from the audience, um, did you actually have an outage in the last six months? Because this is really things that outage is something that we wanna you know, prevent with all the, uh, the activities we do around bringing chaos engineering and observability into your standard practice. Well, let's see, I'm not sure how long we, we give the audience. Yeah, submit. it's kind of interesting to see those answers come in because yeah. I did put a six minute gap into it. So it's six minutes is a long time, but we always are thinking this is fine. We're going to inc through incidents. And I guess it also does depend on the severity of them. But we are seeing a few of you start answering. I think we have around 50% of folks answering now. 
That's cool. And as a, as a reminder, it's I'll fill these polls out, but also leverage the Q and A feature and the and the, the chat feature, right? We want to make sure that we have reserve enough time. I think Anna, you're watching the chat as well. If questions come in that make sense, we'll just pick it up. So leverage the fact that you're live online with us and not just watching this later on. But uh, this is the benefit of being live, asking us questions. Now, while we're waiting for the polls to come in, um, obviously, Anna, I think in the perfect world scenario, if we do everything right to the books, we do chaos from end from front to end, everything should be fine. I think, though, right, uh, not everything is always fine. And we from my perspective, <laughs> From my perspective, it is not fine if you make it to the news. And I just picked two recent examples. I'm pretty sure there's many more. I remember, Anna, you brought a couple of other examples when we were on stage at Perform this year at our conference. You brought, I think this was the Slack outage that happened back then in, in January, February. Yeah. Um, this year were uh, some you know, recent examples. Um, I think the poll is closed. Any quick? What did we learn from the polls? Yeah, we actually ended up seeing that around, it's like 79% of you said you did suffer an outage and that 22% says no, which is actually interesting considering the conversation that's going on on chat where we did have a large outage that Andy's actually bringing up that Fastly outage that ended up getting that half of the internet. So sometimes mm -hmm. we end up realizing that a third party vendor has an incident and that breaks our services. And we're not saying it was their fault nor our fault, but all of a sudden our customers themselves are not able to, to access it. So for a lot of folks, they got hit with it. Yeah. We, we got to see some interesting cascading failures across that outage. And yeah. the, the link just got put for NPR on the chat if someone wants to read about that one. Really, yeah. really insightful. And I think this brings up a good point because it's not just about building resiliency and chaos testing our own code that we write. But we are just writing code that is embedded in many other depending services. And they are, as you know, your, your, your CDN, your DNS, everything is extremely critical because though, if those fail, then you need to prepare for it or you are suffering from it. Now, obviously, we don't want to end up on the news, but this is what we want to prevent. Now, I think we can prevent it. And I want to show you a different example that actually happened to us at Dynatrace uh, just a couple of days ago. I think it is completely fine when instead of being in the news, you receive an email from your director of, automated, uh, of, of cloud automation at Dynatrace and he starts the subject with success story, major issue in a single AWS Frankfurt availability zone. But if you read closer, right, I highlighted a couple of texts where he said, we were alerted through our self-monitoring we didn't have any customer impact. And I think you know, reading the rest, I'll leave it up for a second. This is just re really great. Uh, but obviously, this doesn't come for free. I wrote a blog post about it with more details, especially also giving Thomas some credit. Now, let me, um, well, actually, let's maybe, do, should, we, should we do another poll? Do you have another poll like this? Uh, I think we, I do. I yeah. hear that availability zones sometimes go missing. So our question <laughs> to y'all was, <laughs> If we suffer an outage like Dynatrace got a chance to experience where the availability zone of Frankfurt, choose your favorite availability zone provider, would you have been able to afford that outage? Would that have been a this is fine experience with an exclamation point, a question mark, fire everywhere? What would that be for your team? Really interesting to start seeing folks answer, but I like that you use the word. success stories do we not? Yeah, I like the I like the fact that he used the word missing and AC just got missing. Yeah. Where is it? Is it behind the rug or what's wrong? Did it go around the block and didn't find back home? <laughs> but yeah, as you said, and this is um um I think an interesting story. Now let me while we're waiting for the, the feedback to come back, let me quickly go a little bit into the details of what actually happened. Uh so here's actually what happened on June 10th. We have observability, right? We as Dynatrace, we operate our software for our customers worldwide. We obviously monitor it with Dynatrace. Dynatrace, we are a software intelligence company, so we obviously use our own product, our own platform to monitor uh, all of our infrastructure, including every single of our customers. At 10.40 p.m., 
uh, CST, so that was in uh, late in the evening in Europe. We got alerted by Dynatrace. We're using Ops Genie to inform, and then messages get put to Slack. What is interesting that about four minutes later, uh, the status update was also available on the AWS. So they're doing a pretty good job in making people aware. It's a fantastic story what happened there. They had some heat issue uh, in the data center and that in the end triggered uh, some strain chain of reactions where eventually some gas was automatically put into put out fire that what, even though there was actually no fire, but then it took a couple of hours until people could go back into the data center and pull everything up. So you can read all this, it's a true story. Cool thing is that you know we were actually alerted four minutes prior to the actual thing being announced by AWS on their status page, and um, this is why I think we want to you know give you some guidance. And this is really the reason why Anna and I we are talking about this because we believe there's really a, a couple of critical components to building resilient systems. On the one side, there's chaos. There's also observability that we learned as more, but I think Anna, this is where the two of us can bring in our perspectives from, from, from both sides, right? Because I really don't know how many people can afford to just wait for a data sent out as the first time to figure out if they can, you know, if they have built resilient systems or not, right? And this is why we want to prepare you. We want to show you what's important. What are the, the ingredients? Um, failure, is going, oh, yeah. failure is going to happen, and we are actually seeing some interesting uh, results. I'm going to close the poll in, ten, in 15 seconds, so feel free to answer if you're still listening right now. But yeah, we're we're seeing that insightful part. A lot of folks think that they have already moved to the cloud, and now all of a sudden you get all the capabilities of it without understanding that you need to do the work to make it. So for folks that are, when we ask them who can actually afford to use the availability zone, we're seeing the 45% of folks are responding that their organization can, which is actually a pretty good number. So props to a lot of our listeners for doing the hard work on it. Um, and then the rest of y'all, feel free to take a listen in today on how we share some of those things can be more accessible to your organization. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't come for free, right? Um, so I think you can you cannot just sign up for a service and it's a, it says resiliency as a service. It's not available as an API and you can just connect and then all of a sudden um, you are resilient against any type of chaotic situation. It takes a lot of effort. I think uh, your systems need to be engineered for resiliency. Um, this is just uh, the way we do it at Dynatrace, right? We have from the beginning architectured our architecture we designed our architecture um, to be uh, you know resilient by nature we we multi cluster deployment all of all of our third party compo components uh, aware rec aware so that means like our Cassandra nodes uh, they can easily handle an outage of a particular availability zone or data center um, so it, it's really important now it's not only the architecture it is that observability for us is built in we do continuous performance testing and we also do some chaos testing, which is also important because this gives us more confidence. Now, a little bit more on what happened, just to show you really that this outage didn't really cause us any pain. Our SLOs that we also monitor with Dynatrace were all solid. I mean, a slight impact, but nothing major. Availability was great. We actually only had seven end users because we also do end user monitoring. So we know how many people are on the system right now, only seven users had a minor glitch, and this is exactly these seven users that were on the system before the traffic was redirected over. So minor impact. Also with the observability that we bring in with Dynatrace immediately pointed us to the root cause, which we already knew anyway, because these were some users that were trying to access systems that were just shut down by Amazon and the traffic was rerouted. So really, really important observability to see that, do you have an impact, yes or no? but also observability because it helps you to understand and validate if a system really works as designed. So again, a screenshot from a dashboard that our teams are using to really see that how is our deployment really looking like? Do we really have our nodes deployed in different ACs? And this screenshot was really taken from that time frame when the outage happened, seeing how the traffic was redirected between our server nodes, also between the Cassandra nodes. And this is why I want to highlight again and I want to say, uh, thank you so much for Thomas uh, Reisenbichler, who is the uh, director of autonomous cloud enablement at Dynatrace. He shared the story with us, and I just I love the quote here, right? And 
you know, observing this issue. It was an honor to have the possibility to just sit next to it and do a little bit of babysitting, knowing that we are coping very well with this failure. As I said, this was Thursday night. Um, the Euro Cup is going on right now. I think he's a soccer fan or a football ball, as we call it here in Europe. So he was probably able to just enjoy the games this evening instead of doing some firefighting. <laughs> I was going to say, coming from Costa Rica, I also also only know the football. When people say soccer, I'm like, what? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. This, this actually brings us to that amazing point where this is such a great story. A lot of work got put in. So as we think about the work the Dynatrace had to do to get there from continuous performance testing, chaos engineering, full observability, we have another poll for y'all. We talked, we asked you to think about maybe an outage you had had in the last six months. That outage, could it have been prevented by being more proactive and having better observability and or performing chaos engineering? Are some of these things something that your organization could have maybe considered to make you be a little bit more resilient and have a moment like Thomas and Andy of, this is fine, I'm gonna watch the Euro Cup instead. It's just perfect timing with the Euro Cup. Actually, I have to do one more thing because I've done this the whole last week, even though, right, you know, I'm from Austria and we're not known for great, playing great soccer or football. But And we actually lost against Italy, but it was the best match in history, I think, that I've ever seen. And Austria was actually celebrating the whole weekend, even though we lost against Italy. Um, so I have to wave my flag, just <laughs> still proud <Yes>. of it. <laughs> that is fine, Andy. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, and also shows that this is not scripted here. We are just, you know, <laughs> enjoying our work, enjoying the channel that we are given to uh, educate people. Um, how, what does the poll say? Yeah, so the poll is saying 87% are saying maybe they could have actually prevented this incident with a little bit more of a better observability in chaos engineering. I'm going to keep it open and we can go to the next slide because I have a question. Mm -hmm. What's the question? So that's actually a really cool story. You know, you get a chance to tell us how you get to literally observe the fact that Frankfurt is having an issue, that y'all are actually even being so proactive that you are getting notified even before your cloud provider is even letting you know. So you got a chance to mention that it did take a lot of work to get there. Mm -hmm. But for all of those that are kind of getting started, that are still kind of considering how is it that some of this efforts and time commitment is actually going to get us there? How, how and where is there a connection where all of this comes together? Mm -hmm. So good question. Uh, I was obviously prepared for that question. Uh, so I think on the first that it's a balance between speed and safety, which I think are two key metrics that all of us are asked for from our organization, especially business. We need to, you know, speed up delivery of new features, of new capabilities. On the other side, we need to provide a safety net to make sure that these features and capabilities are actually working uh, in, in, you know, well. Uh, I see from my perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I see that DevOps, which has been a topic that I've been kind of talking about for the last couple of years. This is also why I call myself a DevOps activist. I see DevOps engineers especially coming out from, let's say, the left side of your infinity loop. Um, from engineering and using automation to get their features and capabilities faster out to their end users. Two metrics from the Dora report, deployment frequency and lead time for change, I think, I think are things that they are measured against. So speeding up. On the other side, right, we have, I think, SREs, and obviously you are much better to confirm if that's the case because you have been an SRE at Uber. I see SREs coming really from on, on the operation side who really now need to make sure that as more and more changes are happening more rapidly and more constantly, that systems are still staying resilient and reliable. And therefore they are using automation to really ensure that the systems stay reliable, being measured against metrics like change failure rate or time to restore services. And obviously it looks like they're working from two opposite sides, but what links them together, and this is kind of what, what you're referring to is what I believe uh, is a very key important piece, and we talk about more later, our SLOs, service level objectives, because in the end, we are measured against, is our system up and running? Uh, does it provide the right user experience, the right level of service to our end users? Are we actually making money? Do we keep users, depending on what system you are delivering to your end users, 
you have different success criteria of the services that you're delivering. And I think they are, these SLOs, if well defined and well monitored, they are really the thing that I think should drive us all together to say, yes, we can speed up delivery, but we also want to make sure that everything is resist, re resilient and let's, let's use automation and bake it into our delivery pipeline, our infinity loop uh, to make sure we, we handle this from day one until the features out there and even beyond that. So it's a balancing act, I think, between DevOps and SRE. That's the, that's the key thing. And SLOs are kind of the, the, the link in the middle that's bridging the gap. Definitely. Right. Um, like it, it's so interesting to always hear about how SLOs get to bring us together. Just to close the loop, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. We yeah. got 87% of y'all uh, answering that maybe yes, better observability and or chaos engineering could have prevented the incident that you were thinking about from, from poll number one. And 13% said no. So we'll have more. We have three more polls coming later mm -hmm. on. But as Andy said, this is all a balancing act. And when we're talking about various teams, various different personas coming together to balance it all out, having one thing that unites them really does help. That connected SLOs has definitely been a pushing drive in, in the practices of SRE to get folks aligned, to get management aligned. There's a portion that you can have a business level objective and that trickles down to your service level objective. There's a whole bunch of other content out there about this, but we also get a chance to bring some amazing knowledge into this chat today, because when we talk about all this balancing act, there's so much work that goes into DevOps. There's so much work that goes into SRE. And it's not that one team is better than the other. One practice is more proactive than the other. We are all coming together to do similar work. The SRE just has a different focus. The focus is reliability. But we got a chance to catch an amazing tweet from Miss Amy Toby. Mm -hmm. Very recognized SRE has been around for various organizations, helping them grow. She got a chance to share some of the thoughts on the pillars of what makes site reliability engineering. So in this image, you get a chance to see that there's almost four fundamentals, four pillars that comes into what a lot of the hands-on SRE comes in. So you have service level objectives, incident management, observability, and chaos engineering. If you see, they all have collaborations with one another. When you do one, you're improving on another. When you're trying to build a practice into one, you can start by leveraging the prior practices that you have implemented. So they're all iterative and they build upon each other's successes. So as you focus on perfecting or improving your incident management process, along the way, you're going to be defining SLOs, working proactively on improving observability, and maybe you are practicing incident management by throwing some chaos engineering at it. But for maybe some of the new SREs that are joining in on our chat, what are service level objectives? What are SLIs? Like we hear all these terms, but I feel like Andy, you might have some thoughts on what that is. I may have some thoughts and I gotta say, I, I not stole, I borrowed some ideas on how to talk about it because credit goes to uh, Google. They have done a great job in explaining these concepts based out of their site reliability engineering handbook. So, but let me quickly explain or show you how I explain what this is all about, what SLOs are, but more importantly, what are SLIs, SLOs, SLAs, and there's a new concept that's also like error budget. So first of all, I think it's nothing new, just some really cool terms. SLIs, service level indicators, see it as something that you can measure, like the availability of your, of your system or the response time of a critical business feature, like loading the homepage or logging in. And then you can say, I am expecting my response time to be faster than 400 milliseconds because otherwise I wouldn't even accept that type of service level, right? Now, the service level objective then is taking that SLI, that metric, over a certain time frame and says, hey, within our reporting period, within, let's say, 30 days or seven days or whatever your reporting period is, you expect that metric underneath that threshold in, let's say, 90% of the time. So that means if you chart it, you can easily see that every, every time you are, every time you're below that, match, that threshold, you're good. Every time you're above that threshold, you're bad. Now, an interesting concept is an error budget. And it's also, it's very easily explained. That means 
if you take the example from here, when I say my SLO uh, tells me I have 90% of the time in a month, I have to be faster than 400 milliseconds, which means I have 10% of error room or error budget. So that means that the beginning of my reporting period, if it's, let's say, 30 days, I will start with 10% of error budget available. Now, every time I am slower or I'm failing my SLO, my error budget gets decreased. So at any period of time during my reporting period, I exactly know how much error, how much wiggle room, how much failure can I still allow myself before I violate my own SLO. And that's really the, the whole idea. And this allows you then to make just better decisions. For instance, hey, we still have so much error budget left so we can try to do something fancy and experiment and do another rollout because we know for a rollout, we may have 10 minutes downtime, but 10 minutes downtime is still good. Or if you're already so close, then maybe you are making off of this decision or prioritizing um, your work on something else. And then the last piece of this is really, uh, oops, here we go. The last piece of it is uh, SLAs, service level agreements. And I think this is definitely more common terminology to, to take it easy, to explain it easy. And SLA is what happens if, an, if you fail your SLOs. And you may have SLOs without any impact to your business or to your stakeholders, but for those where you have an impact, even maybe legal obligations, you should define an SLA, service level agreement. So that's the, the kind of the quick expl explainer. Anna, does this make sense? Oh, no, the, thank you for putting that example. And I, and I even love that you're not just sharing about SLIs, SLOs and SLAs. You also got to throw in error budgets because I think sometimes people forget that by putting in the standardization of metrics of reliability and goals that you want your services, teams, organizations to have, you're now building a safety net, but that safety net allows for your engineers to have more of a safety in working in the systems because there is room for error, but there's also room for experimentation that Andy kind of mentioned. And we'll chat a little bit about that in a few minutes. Exactly. And just to show you, right, I mean, this was the theory and the practice looks like you use your observability tools, right? Like this is an example of Dynatrace, how we typically uh, encourage and educate our customers for how they monitor the system, how they use the observability data, and then how they, uh, you know, define good SLOs around either application metrics, business metrics, service metrics, infrastructure metrics. You can define them on any type of level. Um, and, but with this, you can you get an immediate overview of what's happening right now in production. Are you good? Are you not good? Where do you still have wiggle room or where do you need to shift your focus on resiliency versus speed, right? Speed and, and kind of safety, what I said earlier. Now, this is great in production, but the question is now, and this is kind of my, actually, we have a, I have a question to the audience. Do people actually use observability? Because what if they don't use observability, then the best SLO that is defined and if they cannot measure it is kind of worthless because you have it on a piece of paper, maybe. So question would be, do people you have... You want to up my logs and iterate on that and have a count number? Uh, That's yeah. not observability, Andy. <laughs> Depends on who you are and what tool you're selling. And then some people may say this is observability. <laughs> Exactly. But yeah, um, and I think this is this is very important for me. I know as we're waiting for the polls to come in, this is obviously great to have in production. But I think now I want to hopefully this give an, a little into an observability, uh, how important that is, how it allows us to define and measure our SLOs. But now I want to kick it over to you a little bit and also understand where chaos engineering comes in, because we should not just stay production monitoring as slows and we just watch and then we freak out if something goes red. What is not a real use case for chaos engineering? How can this help us to make sure that these dashboards in production stay green all the time? Yeah, definitely. So there's definitely a lot of stuff that we want to kind of consider. First, I love that Andy mentions, you know, it's not just about having observability in production. Going back to my amazing infinity loop revamp, you have that portion where you want to continue shifting left. You want to have built in those fundamentals of observability to be able to have a better understanding of your systems. But why don't you also get a chance to make sure that they look great in staging and development in Q&A that all the other stages before, you're giving your engineers similar tools, one for them to get comfortable with the tooling, but number two for that to be closer to the developer. 
that way they catch possible failures a lot earlier but when we're in the process of shifting left that just seems like such a big upkeep and how do you get our production monitoring system to go in through three different levels prior to that so you don't have to just do that all at once and similarly within observability we also have other practices that can enable you to speed up that process so i'm hearing that 85 percent of folks are doing observability i'm going to be closing that poll mm -hmm. and we're going to chat about chaos engineering so chaos engineering is defined very simple as thoughtful controlled experiments designed to reveal the system weaknesses so if you've heard about chaos engineering in the past maybe you come from hearing from chaos monkey where you're randomly shutting down ec2 instances maybe you've heard about early days where folks would just unplug a data center and hope for the best well chaos engineering has evolved very much throughout the years as it's become a pretty more mature uh, practice and a category within DevOps and SRE, we start seeing that some of the fundamentals are still there. We start out with a scientific method. What is our system? Let's go ahead and look at that architecture diagram. Let's look at our um, observability tools and come up with a hypothesis. If this failure happens into our system, this is how it's going to handle it. If I lose my Frankfurt availability zone, I expect my system to be completely resilient. So I can shut off all my nodes that are being held in the availability zone of Frankfurt and replicate the exact same incident that Dynatrace had had and see if my system was resilient to it. Can I send out an email just as Thomas did and say, this is fine. We got alerted before we actually even got to see somewhere else that these hosts are offline. How is it that you can really be proactive about it? And within the practice of chaos engineering, there's a scientific approach to it. So you're thoughtful, you plan it out, you scope out how you're going to do your chaos engineering by defining a blast radius and a magnitude and running those experiments. You always want to run small experiments. So there's going to be some talk a little bit later in the in the in the slides today about how you can craft your experiments with a little bit better view into your systems and you always want to be sharing your results because at the end of the day you want to make your systems more reliable and you want to let your organization know what y'all are doing so we have that other poll of asking y'all if you do chaos engineering so we're just kind of curious who's practicing, who's getting started, and who's just has not gotten uh, started in it. But we'll we'll get a chance to keep this poll open, and we'll move on to the next slide. For when it comes into using chaos engineering, there's a whole bunch of use cases. And when we look at that diagram from Twitter that I shared a, uh, from Amy, that talks about how observability, incident management, and chaos and SLOs kind of come into play, we see that big use case in the middle of training teams. How can you train your teams to use your observability tooling, onboarding an engineer to a new system, to a new tool, or just getting them to be prepared for their next page? I know my story when getting put on call for the first time is very much like that this is fine, doggo where everything was burning as my pager duty account blew me up at three in the morning when there's this incidents going on in the front end for a reliability service for Uber. And I was just on my third week at this company. I was hoping for the best. I get to my run book is 180 days old. Yes, I am freaking out. I am hoping that by the time that I triage my incident, I still have a job the next day that I walk back in. So why is it that we do that? Why can't we have a better practice in our organizations to train engineers to make sure that we're validating our monitoring and observability has been set up right, but that our runbooks are actually up to date and they've been executed. Create that psychological safety in your organization. We of course also have the chance of testing disaster recovery, like I said, share like go ahead and run some chaos engineering experiments based on outages that you have seen such as the fastly outage such as the slack outage such as the frankfurt outage that just got shared and as you're thinking about breaking apart your monolith to microservices 
that's also a great use case. Finding dependency failures within your within your systems are some other ways that chaos engineering can get you can get you started. So I got a chance to share about those use cases, but that's all just buzzwords or just a sales pitch. What are the ways that you can actually implement some of this? First, I want to go ahead and close out the poll. We see that 31% of folks are doing chaos engineering and 69% of y'all are not. So hopefully from the 69% of y'all, hopefully you'll get a chance to learn about what chaos engineering, how you get started in it in this next slide. So I'm closing out that poll for now. And take a sip, very important. Yes. <laughs> Another one. Where is it that we can get started? Where, let's go ahead and look at the past incident that we had. Why don't we think about losing an availabil availability stone? Maybe that's too much of a blast radius for you and you need something smaller, something that's going to have a smaller blast radius of failure if something doesn't go as expected. Go ahead and just shut down three of your nodes. How is it that your services operate when you lose just a little bit of your capacity? Mind you, this can easily happen when our network breaks or when the heat in our data center in our cloud, maybe something happens and a cable actually also gets busted. Mm -hmm. We also want to think a little bit more proactively. We've all been migrating to the cloud. We know the benefits of the cloud from the cost, from the reliability perspective, but sometimes we're choosing things based on promises by clicking UI buttons. So let's talk about this auto scaling policies. We move to the cloud. I'm going to choose Amazon for this example. We have our clusters on Kubernetes. We think we have auto scaling policy set up, but how long does it take for that auto scaling policy to kick in for those new nodes, those new resources to get put into the infrastructure pool? But then how long does it take for the load balancer to start directing traffic to it? Is that all five minutes? Is that 20 minutes? Is that an hour? Go ahead and do some chaos engineering to find out. And I'll even give you a better reason to do something like this. That Slack outage of January 4th, 5th, 7th, mm -hmm. whenever mm -hmm. the US came back on, if you go read that postmortem, a lot of it was caused because they were betting on auto scaling policies. Their auto scaling policies worked. They did that super well, but they weren't working as fast as they needed. They needed mm -hmm. to be tuned in a little bit more so that the network was able to start routing traffic to the new instances of users coming online. We also have a little bit of a more general way to get started. Go ahead and understand your critical services. What are their dependencies? We'll have a slide on that shortly. And have you been doing chaos engineering to prepare for your next launch? Prepare for your next high traffic event. Prepare for the new feature that you're going to launch at your conferences. We have one of our customers that was about to launch a new big feature for globally, and they ran a game day two weeks before they launched. They found 35 bugs. They needed to fix those 35 bugs before they can launch. If not, the users were going to have a terrible experience on launch day. You want to launch on day zero with reliability in mind. Really good advice, especially for the 60 what percent that don't yet have done any 69 percent. 69 percent. So I think some great advice. Now I got a question that I will also answer myself. Kind of, you gave some some good kind of ideas, but what about chaos specific to the architecture? And I want to show you a little bit what you, actually observability, how observability can help people to find out what are the right experiments that you should run. Here is a view screenshot of our Dynatrace Smartscape. Remember my example from the outage in Frankfurt. So this is what you see in Dynatrace when you deploy and monitor global infrastructure like we have. And then focusing on one of the clusters we run, we can nicely see multi-AC, multi-host, multi-node, the deployment and also the dependency. So Dependency information, both horizontally and vertically, is very good for you to understand your real tool architecture, how it is deployed right now. 
Now, the reason why this is great, it's better than some hand drawing, or maybe even if it's in Visio or on some other tools that are not probably outdated. This is live architectural view from any system that you run. So it helps you to better understand the architecture. Most importantly, coming to the, you brought the example of, well, let's shut down an EC2 instance or it, whatever it is, or a data center. It also helps your observability to actually under, to help you understand what actually runs in a data center. So the smart skip view here is just focusing on exactly one of these availability zones that went down or this data center and that availability zone. So you can see exactly which processes, which hosts, which containers would actually be impacted. And this allows you to actually identify your weak spots. And weak spots, not only from the vertical dependency map, we also uh, like to, you know, especially with distributed tracing, that is a hot topic these days. I mean, we at Dynatrace, we've been doing distributed tracing at least before I started at Dynatrace 14 years ago. Uh, we call it the pure path technology, but one of the visualizations we have here is the service flow, seeing which services are calling which other services for your critical business cases, for your critical features. And also very important on the right side, where are these services running? Are they running really distributed? Do you have load balancing in place? And then if not, or if so, this is a great way for you to figure out, okay, where do I want to inject chaos to really test out if the traffic routing then really works correctly? And I think this is the important thing. Using this observability data allows you to create more realistic and more thoughtful experiments based on, Anna, what you said, based on the critical systems, right? Yes, because I think what we look at is I know when we, I work with all of some prospects and customers or community members on getting started with chaos engineering, we look at an architecture diagram just like this one that I have up from a demo application. We have an architecture diagram. This is a mental model that someone drew of what we think our system is being built to be. We have to go ahead and take architecture models like this and validate them, make sure that we have standalone services such as our ad service where there's not many like it it's getting called in from front end but that's about it we see that there if our email service payment service or shipping service maybe has an issue our checkout service might actually completely fail so when it comes to nailing down those dependencies we want to make sure that we're resilient to them whether they're upstream, downstream, or third party, it doesn't matter. We need to care about them as first class citizens, as specifically to our critical services. But this is outdated. Sometimes if you, if any of you that are listening have come to my workshops, you know that there's two, three issues with this architecture diagram if you got a chance to do some chaos engineer experiment on it. And that is that some things like the Redis are actually a critical service, but it's seen like such a downstream dependency that you wouldn't consider this a critical service. So what are some ways that we can be proactive about it? Well, we got a chance to see what Andy just shared on Smartscape on the service catalog, but how is it that all of this comes in together with observability and chaos engineering? Well, here in this slide, we see where Gremlin is detecting, is, is, is discovering all the services that are running after you install your agent. After we've gotten a chance to discover those services, you can star them, you can save them, and then you can start being proactive about running chaos engineering experiments against them. Make sure that you're running latency, network, resource level attacks. But when it comes to that question, how do I know where to get started? If I don't have a proper architecture diagram, this is where looking at a tool like Dynatrace is extremely helpful. I was able to deploy all of this this week and I went into my Smartscape view of Dynatrace. I'm able to log into Smartscape. I see the way that the 10 microservices are deployed, how all of them are talking to one another. But not only if I hover over them, I get to see that trace. I'm also able to click on the checkout service alone. And I see that there's actually eight services that are calling within it. As I continue drilling down, I can later even find out the processes that are coming in and talking to one of them. So this really allows for you to go super precise and be extremely thoughtful as you do chaos engineering and observability together for the purpose of iterating on each one of them 
to make the whole system better. And of course, in general, make your company and a stronger footprint in the internet and serve your customers 100%. Very nice. I really like that you are leveraging SmartScape now, making it easier to really identify what are the systems, the services that should be tested. Because I think the important thing, and we discussed this in the preparation of our webinar, we don't have endless time. We have limited time to do thoughtful experiments, really on those critical components. And with observability, we get to learn what are the critical components. And with chaos, we can then test it. And the nice thing about this, and I want to highlight this, the way that you build the integration, because I want to ask the question, would people now with all the learnings feel comfortable running chaos experiments in production? Maybe, yes, maybe no. But I wonder, while you answer this question, what you see here is the true power also of the integration between the two of our tools. Because as you are running chaos experiments with Gremlin, you are sending information over to Dynatrace that there is an experiment running right now which means on the first end, right, your observability will validate that there's some chaos going on. We call it the problem evolution view that you see here in the animated screen that really shows you when did the problem start, how did it kind of trickle through your architecture, where are the weak spots and how did they infect other systems. But the important thing is that we also get the link back to Gremlin, meaning if your observability platform like Dynatrace will alert your operations teams, they will also then understand, hey, this actually came in from Gremlin. So maybe you're not like, you know, shouting out on Twitter automatically that you have a problem, but you know, this is part of an experiment, which is also very important. But it's really great that with the collaboration that we've done together, we can make chaos engineering safer also in production because we're not freaking people out because we tell them that something is actually going on. And it's actually interesting you you say that because as a uh, as like like there's still time to answer the poll, but we're seeing that 83% of folks would feel more comfortable with such level of observability view into crafting their experiments. But we are still we're also seeing 17% say no. And for that 17%, that's 100% okay for you to still not feel comfortable. It is a big ask to ask someone to please inject failure into their system. But number one. Failure is going to happen whether you inject it or not, but you getting a chance to inject it is on your own terms, on your own timing. And when you do chaos engineering with Gremlin, there is a button for you to roll back the experiments. And that really creates an amazing safety when you're like, Dynatrace says that my SLO is breached. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and stop that experiment. And we also have automation where you can say API, if this SLO hit, hits red, please call this API and stop all my experiments. So there's mm. ways that you can build confidence. And that mm. does take me to my next slide. Your next slide, look at that, here we go. Woo. <laughs> we were joking that it's basically saying, hey Andy, next hey. slide, it's just yeah. like, hey Alexa. <laughs> Don't be too loud, she's listening in. I know, I was like, mine's about to go off. It's actually <laughs> listening to me right now, cool. So when we talk about automation and doing chaos engineering, we know that it's a hard ask. And we say to always start out with chaos engineering and experiments in development, then later start in staging. But when you're getting started, start with small blast radius experiments, small magnitude experiments. And the same thing applies when we talk about automation. I want you to automate your chaos engineering experiments across all environments, across all critical services. That is the full maturity of chaos engineering. But go ahead and get started on automating experiments and development. Look at Smartscape and run chaos engineering experiments and development. Build that confidence, move on to staging, move on to production, bring that into CICD. That takes me to your next slide, I think, with CICD. What is what exactly. do all these and, operations and mean to do? Yeah, and this is an awesome uh, segue over to Captain, our CNCF open source project that we're both collaborating on. You're even on the advisory board, so thank you so much for it. I will make it quick because I'm looking at the time. Our as our error budget or our time budget for the remaining couple of minutes is getting uh, smaller and smaller. So one thing we've been doing is uh, really trying to figure out how can we do something that we, and I think you came up with it, is test-driven operations. Meaning we want to obviously get to auto-remediation, which means we want to execute code automatically 
to counter chaotic situations in production. And this is just should be considered whatever script it is, whatever runbook automation it is, it should be considered just as code. This needs to be tested. And this is why I feel more comfortable with it, with the option of bringing our CNCF project captain in with its capability to automate, automate remediation um, sequences. We can use a tool like Gremlin in a pre-production environment, fully automatically causing chaos, validating that Dynatrace, for instance, monitors, observes the chaos, alerts. But then the most important thing is allows your site reliability engineers to not in old Word documents that are outdated, but in good old remediation as code files, specify for which problem, which actions to be executed. Captain will then fetch the first action that should be executed as part of a certain problem, executes the action, and then most importantly, coming and closing the loop to SLOs, always validating if this action actually brought the SLO back to a, a good state so we're not eating up our error budget. And if that doesn't work, then we pick the next action. Validate again. Hopefully everything goes good. If not, we can still escalate. But this is a great way to validate that the remediation that you expect later on to run in production and fix a chaotic situation actually really works. And that's the key thing. Now, Anna, I know we are, I'm doing it quick. Captain is an open source project. The power of open source is amazing. See the quote from Tarash. Captain feels like a, sorry. Captain feels like a reference implementation of Google Site Reliability Engineering and the Site Reliability Workbook. That was an amazing honor to hear this from a face from an engineer from Facebook. If folks are interested in more, and I will let you talk in a second, then there's a lot of links here. Now, Anna, to you. Yes, good. please go ahead and check out Captain. It's an amazing open source repo that I get the chance to work with folks like Andy on by sitting on the board, but also learning more about SRE from folks like Andy also just really shares more about the full community of SRE. We are here to work with one another, work on open source projects to build a more reliable internet at the end of the day. But that allows for us to get to that closing slide of we want to build a more reliable internet at Gremlin, at Dynatrace, as SREs, as DevOps, as attendees of this webinar. You can get a chance to see that the ingredients that we talked about today really bring that together. Mm -hmm. Within observability, we really focus on defining those service level objectives, having those SLOs be connected and run chaos engineering experiments to validate all that. We now get a chance to move on and understand our architecture in a way better way that allows for us to automate some of our experiments, which is getting us closer to the full test driven operations. Mm -hmm. But we're now then taking those learnings from observability to now make our observability even better and bring it all back into making your incident management process just amazing. <laughs> And with this, I think in the end, right, if fire is on the roof or in the house or in the data center, I think if you do it all right, the ultimate goal is achievable. And this is really what it is. And hopefully we inspire a couple of those people that say they don't use observability right now or don't do chaos engineering. Now, if people want to learn more, there's a lot of resources out there, right? Get a chance to try out Gremlin for free. You'll get a chance to try the 11 attacks that Gremlin allows for you to do on the infrastructure level. Sign up for Gremlin free on go.gremlin.rocks slash free. You can also get your Dynatrace trial by heading over to dynatrace.com slash trial. Easy to install guides everywhere on their site. And if you wanna learn about what we talked about of how Dynatrace and Gremlin work really well together, check out our tutorials. There's two tutorials that are linked out over at go.gremlin.rock slash gremlin dash and and then <laughs> Dynatrace. Just look at the link. <laughs> uh, exactly, it's easier. <laughs> and last but not least, what is this? Yes. If anyone is interested in really pushing forward their learning within DevOps and SRE, Gremlin just launched the first uh, certification around chaos engineering. So get on over to gremlin.com slash certification, spend some time learning about chaos engineering and become a certified chaos engineer. Very good. And now if there's still people there that have questions, then we would be happy to take questions, I think. 